A long time ago in the year 1968, a man by the name of Ermin Schmidt said to his friends, hey, you want to be in a band where instead of writing music, we just mess around and see what comes out? And his friends said, sure. They named themselves after some Chef Boyardee, and after a year of looking around for a label who'd actually release their music, they put out their debut album Monster Movie in 1969 on Liberty Records. This album can arguably be seen as the starting point to a rising experimental music movement in Germany now being pressed onto wax. In the following years, the genre would hit its prime, with essential bands that have names you can correct your friends on how to pronounce, like Noi, Faust, Popol Vuh, and Amandol, but only the sequel because the first one sucks. With this abundance of strange music, as well as Faust cheating the system and releasing a whole album for the price of a single, causing it to actually chart high enough to gain sizable attention, the British press took notice and labeled this movement as Krat Rock because they were still mad at them about World War II. This was first meant in a derogatory way, but the name stuck as bands seemed to embrace it. Faust actually named the first song off of their album Faust 4 after it, which nowadays is one of the most celebrated albums to come from the entire scene. Funnily enough though, another weird musical movement was going on in England at the same time, specifically in Canterbury, where bands with more English sounding names like Gong, Soft Machine, Caravan, and who could forget EGG, were making music that fused progressive rock with the likes of jazz and electronic music. Both of these genres saw tremendous success with chart topping tracks like Misfortune and Moon and June. <laughs> when I say chart topping, I don't mean these charts, I mean these charts. With experimental music's rising, albeit niche popularity, the floodgates for what could be done in music had been opened wider than ever before. This would inspire English musicians Fred Frith and Tom Hodgkinson to start a band called Henry Cow- Oh yeah, that's what this video is about. While Henry Cow weren't a part of the German Krautrock scene and not quite Canterbury either, their music was massively influenced by both of them. They would end up kinda accidentally creating their own genre known as Rock and Opposition after gathering a bunch of bands together to perform at a festival of the same name in 1978. So I guess you can call their music avant prog or rock and opposition, but no matter what genre you group them into, they pretty much sound unlike any other band you've heard. Now when Henry Cow started, their music was entirely instrumental. Records like Legend and Unrest sounded like a rhythmically more adventurous and linear take on the Canterbury scene, seamlessly fusing the melodic improvisation of jazz with the instrumental palette of experimental rock. In 1974, they started collaborating with Slap Happy, a German art pop band who, while not really sounding kraut rock, did have ties to the scene as founding member Peter Blevgad briefly played in Faust. Also, Faust played alongside Slap Happy on their first couple albums. Should probably mention that. The band's music is much catchier and to the point than Henry Cow's, given their emphasis on melody and song lengths that look like actual song lengths. The thing that makes them stand out the most, apart from having solid songwriting and nice chamberful instrumentation, is Dagmar Krauss's vocals. She sounds like if Joanna Newsom had a German accent, and because her voice is so unique and high pitched and upfront, it plays off the music to give a whimsical, almost Disney like sense of wonderment. Slap Happy and Henry Cow would release two albums together in 1975. The first of them was called Desperate Straits, which is an excellent album on its own, but for a collaborative project feels a little one-sided. While Henry Cow's contributions to the record certainly feel present given its emphasis on angular rhythms and a broader instrumental palette, it feels more like a slap-happy album featuring Henry Cow than a full-on collab. That's not to discredit or say you shouldn't listen to this album though, as it's really one of the best and most overlooked experimental albums of the 70s. Hell, if you decide to listen to this album without even knowing either band, then this isn't even an issue to begin with. As great as Desperate Straits is, the second album that these two teamed up for not only feels like a proper collaboration bringing out the absolute best in what makes each band awesome, but is possibly the best thing either of the two have been involved with. In other words, yes, today we're looking at the obscure rock equivalent of Mad Villainy with Henry Cow and Slap Happies in Praise of Learning. Now Henry Cow, despite not really belonging to one particular scene, is a band that defines the early years of experimental rock like few others do. In fact, since they were influenced by the musicians who lived around them, they were able to take the signature Canterbury sound and rework it into something completely different. The same can be said for Slap Happy, as like I said before, they had ties to the kraut rock scene. What makes In Praise of Learning such a fantastic and essential moment for rock music is that it was basically two entirely different musical renaissances coming together into one album. It's also worth noting that in the 70s, Germany was still reinventing itself after the tragedies of World War II. In fact, the entire ethos of Krautrock to begin with was to make music that was completely different in an effort to mirror the times of the country, as well as the expressions of German musicians who grew up in a time of war. Due to this, and the fact that both a German and British band were making an album together, the lyrics on In Praise of Learning do get very political and even existential, and nowhere is this more prevalent than on the very first track, simply and bluntly titled War. Despite this only being two and a half minutes and Wait, two and a half minutes. This album's only got five tracks and it's 40 minutes. Whatever. Despite only being two and a half minutes long, the song is packed with more content than most songs that are double or even triple its length. It wastes absolutely no time, as within the very first seconds, the band strikes the listener with an odd time signature emphasized by a staccato melody. The vocals and leading instruments are in sync with one another, making the track feel guided yet still strange in the context of everything else. The song also doesn't sacrifice being proggy for the length, as a short bit of industrial comes in at the middle point. 
with the instrumentation getting much jazzier and busier for the second half, perfectly timed with the song lyrically. Speaking of which, as you can guess from the title, the song is about war, but rather than focusing on one specific war thus eventually getting the song, it handles the topic from a much larger scale questioning how and why living beings go to war to begin with. Different cultures, religions, and languages have divided the human race, giving humans a reason to feed into their natural violent instincts. All of these things build up over time, hatching the giant monster egg that was war. The way the song personifies war as this giant fictional monster while also alluding to real world events is not only a cool comparison, but keeps the song's message more relevant than say an anti-war song from the 60s folk revival. Dagmar's vocals are laid on thicker than ever and her passionate distinct voice combined with her German accent really makes it kinda hard for me to imagine the song being sung by anyone else, despite Peter Blevgad letting his vocals for a couple lines. The album's political themes continue on the second track, Living in the Heart of the Beast, and oh, yep, there it is. While the length may look intimidating, this is one of the most perfect rock songs ever made, period. It's an extended take on political stagnation caused by different economic classes, so yeah, hear that Pink Floyd? You weren't the first to do it. The song fits the album's overarching war narrative, as Dagmar relates these themes to war itself, as envy is a common reason for violence. The first bulk of the song's vocal performances are done over a seamless harmonization of strange guitar tones and theatrical pianos, not only giving the song a unique soundscape, but making it feel like a true collaboration between the different musical worlds of each respective band. The vocal melodies come in and out between passages that may be improvisational, yet feel carefully planned. The noisier, distorted bits and xylophone solos are chaotic enough to be unpredictable, yet sound so meticulous. It's like we're really seeing the magic of what a proficient improviser is able to accomplish and what makes this approach to music so special in the first place. Around the 10 minute mark, the track becomes explosive, combining rock, jazz, and baroque music in a way that seriously reminds me of Intermounting Flame. In other words, yeah, this slaps. I guess it would be a good time to mention that this album has been differently mixed a few times, and pretty much every version of the song that exists online has this really weird fraction of a second cutoff between the instrumental passage and where Dagmar comes back to bring her final verse. I'm going to use this as an excuse to flex my 1979 reissue of the record which I got on Reverb LP. I'm not sponsored, but I wish I was. Email me, Reverb. And clarify that my copy of the record doesn't have this issue, meaning that some slight audio slip-ups that you might hear if you try to listen to this thing online are a result of an awkward shift in platform. I'll leave a link in the description to a playlist I made which has the best mixes of each song that I could find on YouTube because this album isn't on Spotify, at least in the States. Good thing I have Apple Music. Wait. Why is this song not on? The track closes on a more optimistic note as Dagmar's powerful voice and lyrical call to action allows her to come across as the leader of a rebellion against an oppressive government. This is one of the most well-paced, perfectly composed, ambitious, and dense offerings in all of progressive rock and is still severely overlooked to this day, maybe because you can't stream it. The chaotic free improvisation of The Long March continues right where the previous track left off, only being much less melodic and more of a creepy ambient detour. In an interview with the band's drum player Chris Cutler, the track was entirely improvised, only being under the direction of a voice inside the player's headphones counting off, forcing them to either switch tempos or stop playing whenever the voice hit 4. With this in mind, the constant shifting of different sounds and tempos is extremely engaging from front to back, especially with how wide a range of instruments the band is working with. He also referred to this track as a token improvised piece, as the band would frequently improvise live and the written material on their albums didn't always reflect that. But I'm gonna analyze it anyway! Given the track title and the sounds of muted instruments behind a wall of various noises, the song could symbolize the hardship of lower class citizens trying to move up and bring the rest of their community with them. Or maybe it's the starting point of a post-apocalyptic world where the economy crashes and everyone's in shambles, as the next track, Beautiful as the Moon, SLASH! terrible as an army with banners, takes on that very topic. It's back with just as much compositional detail as Living in the Heart of the Beast, only with a more confined roster of instruments, only adding to the song's post-apocalyptic themes. Not much is worked into the mix besides a piano and crashing percussion with heavy emphasis on cymbals, but damn, they're able to do so much with just these two instruments. It almost feels like a denser, slightly more aggressive take on vocal jazz with the comparatively sparse instrumentation allowing for freely formed creativity, especially around the five minute mark where the drunken piano section stumbles in for a solo. Now this is jazz. The final track, Morningstar, is another improvised instrumental, and one that manages to be both louder and eerier than the other one. The atonal shrieking of woodwinds and crashing percussion filling an empty void of silence makes the song as minimal as it is harsh. It feels slightly less structured than The Long March, but makes up for it in atmosphere. It's really an indescribably haunting way to end the record off, as if to say the album's cautionary political themes are likely going to stay an issue in the future, and there's nothing that the common person can do other than just see what happens next. Overall, In Praise of Learning is one of the most important, essential, and fantastic albums in all of experimental rock. 
Its conscious lyrics, thrilling compositions, and wide variety of soundscapes make it a defining moment for its era, yet one that doesn't sound like any other. It's the brilliance of a talented group of improvisers and songwriters with different musical backgrounds coming together to make the most poignant statement that they can with their music. And if you haven't checked it out, I hope I've persuaded you to do so. Thanks for watching, and if you like the video, then you know the drill.